Amen. Thank you, John. Church, would you say thank you to the Father's Day Choir? Good job, guys. Man, yeah. All men's choir. Great job. If you have a Bible, let me invite you to open it up to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. As you're turning there, we have a star and special guest in our midst today. It is a family, Aaron and Emily Peters, church planners and uh, extraordinary. Stand up. Let everybody look at you. Stand up. There they are, little girl. Happy Father's Day. All right, y'all can sit back down. Glad to have them here uh, with us. Now, as you're turning there, a couple of things I want you to be aware of. We've got Vacation Bible School coming up tomorrow. Starts around uh, 5 o'clock. No matter what time does it start? Starts at 6 o'clock. Oh, i got to be here at 5. Starts at 6 o'clock, and we'll go, uh, I don't know, to eternity or, eternity or something. But anyway, it'll be late. You be praying for uh, Vacation Bible School, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, that God will use that time for a lot of families that are not associated with any church whatsoever, be coming into Hickory Grove. It is a really important time. Pray that the Lord will use that as a means to draw people to himself. I appreciate you. Those of you that have worked so hard uh, to get Vacation Bible School ready, and uh, this week will be a great week. Now, if you're a guest with us today, you've come into a series. We're right in the middle of a series. We've been about a year and a half in the book of Genesis we took a little break to look at uh, the five solas. Those are five core beliefs of what it means to be an evangelical Christian. That means we believe that we are saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the Scripture. That's what I'm going to preach today. According to the Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. That's what I'll preach next week. So today we look at Scripture alone and the passage we're looking at is 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you found that, why don't you stand? We'll read together God's Word. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Get a hold of your kid down there, Aaron, will you? Okay, all right. 2 Timothy chapter 3. What I'd like to do is uh, I'm going to pay a lot of attention to verse 15, 16, and 17, but I want to back up to verse 12 so that we all have context when I read it. I want you to, to get the punch of the entire passage but we'll spend most of our time in verse 15, 16, and 17. Let's start in verse 12. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's begin in verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil people and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you... Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Join me as we pray. Father in heaven, I pray by your spirit you will prevent me from saying anything that's inaccurate. But instead I would rightly represent and expound your truth. And as you do that, I pray, Holy Spirit, you will move in the hearts of people, your children, to bring about conviction and change. I pray especially for those that believe you exist and have yet to surrender to the Lordship of Christ. Holy Spirit, would you break through whatever barriers they've put up? Make today the day where he comes to Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I have many people here in this church this morning that are from various church traditions. Those various church traditions, many of uh, those churches are formal in nature when it comes to the worship service. 
my background before becoming a Baptist was a part of a church like that. And in those churches, a lot of times you'll recite a creed, a creed known as the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed is not Scripture. It's not Scripture, but it is an ancient affirmation of biblical Christian doctrine. Apostles' Creed. Believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, He rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. That is a Christian statement that is based completely on an infallible view of the Bible, a view that says the Bible is the Word of God. I give you that as a background to tell you something I've read. Last week, the Christian Post, which is a reputable Christian publication, the Christian Post tells the story of the Minnesota Annual Conference of United Methodists. That in that conference, the Minnesota Conference of the United Methodist Church has decided to edit the Apostles' Creed. So that what they've done is removed all references to God as Father. Now this is what happens when you start loosening your view on the authority of the Bible. Thirty years ago in our own denomination, Southern Baptist Church, 30 years ago in our own denomination, we as Southern Baptists, you might not have even known this, we were teetering on the edge of theological liberalism. Now, when I say liberalism, I mean theological and not political. Don't confuse the two. We were teetering on the edge of theological liberalism. Our churches were starting to trend moderate. Our seminaries, a seminary is where young men go to be trained for the pastorate to learn how to handle the Bible and what to do in church when it comes to leadership. Our seminaries were not affirming the true inerrancy of Scripture. We were in a crisis. And in 1987, when 30,000 people gathered together at the Southern Baptist Convention, 1987 was a watershed convention. Jerry Vines, who is a great preacher of another age, Jerry Vines stood up and he preached a monumental message and the title of his message was A Baptist and His Bible. You can go look up the sermon somewhere. And in that sermon, he affirmed what Christians have historically believed, that the Bible, all 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, that the Bible, all of it, is God's infallible, inerrant word. And if that's the case, if you believe that, that means that this book is sufficient to give us all we need to know when it comes to knowing the living God in a saving way through Jesus Christ. It's why we do expositional preaching. What is expositional preaching? That is me standing up, reading the Bible, 
and then spending all my time in a sermon talking about the Bible. You know why I do that? For several reasons. One of the reasons is I do that because let's just say that I blow it in the sermon, that it is a terrible sermon. I mean, the worst sermon you ever heard. If that happens, don't say it out loud. Whisper it to people, okay? But let's just say that that happens, that I preach a terrible sermon at the very bottom, at least we have prayed together, we've sung songs to the Lord together, and we have read the Bible out loud together. Now, the reason we do expositional preaching is the Bible must be the centerpiece of a sermon. It's why on Thursday, 90 of our students got together and spent most of the day studying the Bible intensely. It's why next week, when we start Monday, we have vacation Bible school and not vacation Facebook school or vacation fill-in-the-blank school. It, it's why this passage, it's why the Apostle Paul was telling the young pastor Timothy to tie his life and his ministry to the trustworthiness of the Bible. The Bible is the very Word of God. When you hear the Bible, you hear from God. So I'd like to say the message like this. Here's the theme. God's Word is God's message for all people. God's Word is God's message for all people. I was going to say God's Word is God's message for God's people. But the truth of the matter is, it's not just for people sitting in here today. This Bible is written for everybody so that everybody might hear and know who Jesus Christ is. Okay, let's take a, a quick look at verse 15 and 16 and 17. All right, three verses. I'll turn them into three points. Here's the first one. Number one, the Bible is all about Jesus Christ. The Bible, all of the Bible is all about Jesus Christ. To see this, we've got to pick up in the middle of a thought as Paul is talking to Timothy, and we hear him in verse 14 and 15 as Paul, the older man, is directing Timothy, the younger man, his, directing his attention to the Bible. Notice what the text says in verse 14 and 15. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. You might want to circle that. The sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Sacred writings. You see that phrase? You're going to see Paul do a lot here. He uses that word right here and doesn't use it anywhere else in the entire New Testament. This is the only time you ever hear him talk and use the words sacred writings. What is he talking about? He's talking about the Old Testament. He's saying, Timothy, look back at the Old Testament. That Old Testament is there for a purpose. It is completely sacred. By the way, let me put a pause here. Don't let some preacher tell you that the Old Testament is no good for Christians today. He doesn't just disagree with me. He's disagreeing with the Apostle Paul. Hit the pause button and keep moving. Keep looking there at verse 15. Notice that the aim and the content of sacred writings. Do you see it, verse 15? The aim and the content of sacred writings was to point people to Christ, to point to Christ and God's saving purpose in Christ. Keep looking at verse 15. Look at it. Look how it's written. The sacred writings that are able, what are they good for? They're able to make you wise for salvation. Now, why did he use the word wise? Now, not you, why not use the word smart for salvation? Or might, why not use the word awakened to salvation? They are able to make you wise for salvation. Why? Because the Bible tells us that a fool says in his heart that there is no God, and the Bible will point you to Christ, and that's going to awaken a, a wisdom in you that will lead to salvation. The, the Bible doesn't provide salvation. We don't worship the Bible. The Bible doesn't provide salvation. The Bible points us to the one who is salvation. Keep looking at verse 15. Look at it. That the sacred writings are able, they have the power, the Bible has power. The, the sacred writings are able to make you wise for salvation. How? Through faith in Christ Jesus. So what does the scripture do? 
The scripture is here not just to help us live better. The scripture is here to enlighten us to our need for Jesus Christ. I mean, isn't that what the Lord Jesus said? When you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and in the Gospel of John, Jesus is debating with the Pharisees who knew the Bible. The Old Testament knew it well. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse 39. Jesus says, You search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they, the Scriptures, that bear witness about me. What is he saying? From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is unashamedly Christian. The Old Testament anticipates Christ. The New Testament explains Christ. The Old Testament is a promise that is made. The New Testament is a promise that has been kept. When you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, when you read the Bible, it is about Jesus Christ. He is prophesied in the beginning. He is pictured in the middle. He is revealed in the end. Jesus is the hero of the Bible. And he must be the point of every Christian sermon. Let me stop there and say to you, for those of you that are visitors, if you're a visitor here with us today and you've, been, you've moved into Charlotte and you're looking for a church home and you're sort of visiting different churches to see what is going to best um, suit your family, if the children's and the, and the student ministry is right or if it's going to be something good for you, if you can meet people, is it close enough? I would just say to you, I want you to take all of those criteria and move them off the table for a moment. The most important thing you should be looking for is when you go into a time of gathering with God's people on a Sunday, is someone going to stand up, open the Bible, and point you to Jesus Christ from the Bible? If a man stands up to preach a sermon, number one, if you go and hear a preacher and he's not using the Bible, don't ever go back to that church. I don't know what that guy is, but it's not a Christian preacher. Don't go there. Number two, if you go and hear a sermon, and that sermon is more about how to help you live better and an encouragement to you without pointing you to the all-sufficiency of the beautiful Savior, Jesus Christ, don't go back to that church. Why? Because Jesus is the hero of the Bible, and he must be the point of every single sermon. The Bible is not. There's a couple of you that got that. Thank you. The Bible, the Bible is not a playbook for life. It is a roadmap to Jesus Christ. The Bible is not an instruction manual. It is a rescue plan. The Bible, the walk around saying this is your love letter. The Bible is not a love letter. It is a life giver. Th think about Paul. When Paul explains the gospel... In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when he's, when he's writing to the church at Corinth, that's a good place to go, by the way, if you want to have a succinct picture of what the gospel actually is. It's in 1 Corinthians 15, and about verses 3, 4, and 5. And there, as he is explaining the gospel, Paul says, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. You remember the story of, of the resurrection in Luke chapter 24 when Jesus meets up with the two disciples that are coming out of Jerusalem and heading to Emmaus after the death of Jesus. They don't know Jesus has been raised from the dead. They're walking along the road from Jerusalem to a town called Emmaus and a stranger comes up beside them. You can go look this story up in Luke 24. And they don't realize that it's Jesus. And they're talking about Jesus being crucified. And Jesus says to them, what are you guys talking about? They explain what has happened in Jerusalem. And here's what the text says. Go read it sometime. Jesus then took Moses, which is the Old Testament, Moses and the prophets. Wouldn't you like to be in that Bible study? Took Moses and the prophets and showed them how every bit of it had to do with him. You see, all of the Bible is about Jesus Christ. According to this passage in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, the sacred writings, they are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. What you have here is a comprehensive portrait of Jesus so that 
when you read this and hear a sermon that points you to Christ, we might have faith and be saved. The Bible shows us, the Bible shows us the Savior who died to bear man's sin. The Bible shows us a Savior who died and was buried, who was raised again from the dead in victory. The whole storyline of the whole Bible brings us to Jesus Christ. The Old Testament foretells Christ. The Gospels give us the birth, life, and death, and resurrection of Jesus. The book of Acts shows us the church of Jesus Christ. Romans, which I might preach next year, no promises, but I might preach it next year. Romans, what does it show us? It gives us the theology and the doctrine of Christ. Go to the epistles, Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians, Colossians and the Timothys and the Thessalonians and Titus. We have there how to live out in practical holiness to become more like Christ. Go to Hebrews, shows us how excellent Christ is. Flip to the back of the book, the Revelation. There we see the soon coming King Jesus, all of the Bible. You, you, you know this verse. All of the Bible shows us that God loves us. A love that is so certain and so strong that He sent His only Son, Jesus, so that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. It's my first point. The Bible is all about Jesus Christ. Let me give you a second point to consider as we walk through the text. Here's number two. <clears throat> number two, the Bible is all given by God. I might should have said all of the Bible is given by God. I need an English teacher to help me sometimes when I'm putting these together. The Bible, all of it, is given by God. Let me show you where I get that. It's right there in the first part of verse 16. Here is a very important part. You've been sleeping up to this point? You shouldn't be. I've been shouting at you for 15 minutes. Wake up. I want you to see something here, verse 16. Here's something very important. Let me read it to you. Do you see it? Verse 16. Keep look, look at it. All Scripture is breathed out by God. Now pause there. You should circle that phrase. All Scripture is breathed out by God. That for word phrase in English, breathed out by God. It took four English words to translate one word in Greek. It's a word that, that Paul probably made up. It's a, the word is theonoustos. Theo, Greek for God. Noustos is um, Greek for breath or air. It's where we get pneumatic or even pneumonia has to do with breathing. And he took these two words wouldn't you just like to be able to do this? Took two words, just slammed them together and made a word right there to describe what the Bible is. He says, Scripture is God-breathed. Now, keep looking at verse 16. All Scripture is breathed out by God. You know what that tells us? If it's breathed out by God, think about where we get it, that tells us that the content of the Bible, that the origin of the Bible all of the scriptures. This text reminds us, this is why we use the Bible so much. This text reminds us that the Bible originated in God's mind. It's been communicated by God's mouth. It's carried by God's spirit. It is written for God's people. It reveals God's plan and it points us to God's Son so that we, me and you, might live our lives for God's glory. You'll, you'll notice in verse 16, keep looking at it, that, that all Scripture is breathed out by God. We've been talking about that little phrase, breathed out by God. Back up and see what's breathed out by God. All of Scripture. All. You see that word all? You might want to circle it. That, uh, that word all in Greek, you know what it means? All. That's what it means. How's that for some revelation for you? All of it. That, that every single word, every phrase, every nuance, every doctrine in the Bible is there by God's will and for His glory. That the, how did inspiration work? That the Bible, 
was given to us by God. The Holy Spirit worked through the biblical writers to pin, write down, God's Word entirely and exactly as God intended. Think about Genesis. We've been preaching Genesis. Just as God spoke the universe into existence, so also God breathed out His Word in Scripture. I mean, that's what's going on right here in this passage. In this passage right here, Paul is giving us our doctrine of the inerrancy of Scripture. You, you want to know why do we think that the Bible is true? It's not because it's such an old book and it's been around for so long. It's right here, this self-attesting. Now, this has real implications. Paul is affirming the total inspiration of all Scripture. This has implications for us. This means that you can't walk around saying you believe that God's Word, that the Bible is God's Word, you believe every bit of it, and not actually read it. What good is it for you to believe this is God's Word and you don't actually want to hear from God? So this has implications for your interaction with God's Word. This has implications for your obedience. You know what this means? This means that we can't, we don't have the right, we are not the arbiters of truth where we can decide what is good and what's not. We have to flip that over and stand under the authority of the Bible. It means we can't pick and choose the parts of the Bible that we like and don't like. Right, I should probably shouldn't say it like that because there are some things I don't like, but I still have to, I still have to do them. So let me say it like this. We can't pick and choose which commands in the Bible we're going to obey or not obey. Push on a little further. If this is filled with doctrine, we don't have the right to choose which doctrines we will believe and not believe. Let me um, give a little bit of, of an illustration. Be careful as you, um, be careful when you look back in history and if you start thinking about, I wish we could return back to how things used to be in America, how, how America used to be so great. Let's reach back and be like we used to be. Well, there's some people sitting in this uh, congregation that don't want to go back to the 50s and 60s. So reach back a little further. You say, well, I wish we were back in the 1800s. There's some people sitting here that don't want to go back there. What about to the founding fathers? You know, this Christian, this, this nation was a Christian nation. Let's reach back there. You know that most of the founding fathers were deist. Deist. You know what a deist is? A deist is someone that believed in God, that there was a God, but he uh, did the universe like a watch. He wound it up and now is watching it unwind. That he created it, but otherwise he's not interfering. Most of the founding fathers, not all of them, but most of them were deists. For instance, Thomas Jefferson, one of our founding fathers. Thomas Jefferson came to the Bible and instead of standing under the authority of the Bible, he flipped it over and he became the authority over the Bible. And as he read the Bible, when he came to the Gospels and saw things that he did not like, he just cut them out. I mean, literally cut those pieces out of the Bible so that finally when he was done, he printed out a Bible that had only those things that he thought ought to be in the Bible. It's called the Jefferson Bible. You go look it up sometime, Jefferson Bible. If the Bible is in fact, if the Bible is in fact breathed out by God, then in this Bible, we see that God has set a righteous standard that no one, not any of us, not me, not you, that no one can keep. And if that's the case, this confirms that every single person born is a sinner. And if, and if that's true, press on the logic a little further. If, in fact, you are born as a sinner, that means that all of us, without Christ, 
are under God's judgment. And we then are in need of a Savior, Jesus Christ. And so this text right here speaks to effective evangelism. You see, the heart and soul of reaching people for Jesus Christ is teaching and preaching and witnessing the Bible. That the bad news is that God judges sinners. The good news is that Jesus Christ died in the place of sinners and took that judgment. And that if you will believe that, turning from your sin and turn to Christ, the Bible says that you'll be saved. The Bible, it's all about Jesus Christ. The Bible is all given by God. Let me give you a third thing about the Bible. Number three. The Bible is all, all of it is written for man, for mankind, for all of us here. Let me show you where I get this. You have to come into verse 16 and verse 17. Let's pick up the rest of the passage and see what is the usefulness. What, what benefit is there in the Bible? Well, let me show it to you in verse 16. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable. There's a good word. Profitable for four things. See them? For teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The result is in verse 17. That the man of God might be complete and equipped for every good work. All right, back up a little bit. See the words. See the words. They, they mean something. Verse 16 is the word profitable that the the Bible is profitable. It is beneficial. That word is productive. It is sufficient for four things. What's that first thing? What is the Bible good for? Number one is for teaching. Verse 16, for teaching. When you see the word teaching, it's talking not so much about the method. We can all have different methods of teaching. It's talking more about the content. That we have one source. The Bible is the one source. It is the repository of Christian doctrine. How do we combat heresy? Learn the Bible. How do we deal with our sin? Learn the Bible. Why am I going through Genesis? I've been preaching through Genesis for a year and a half. Why, why are we doing that? Because I'll tell you this, in Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, you have the doctrine of creation. Genesis chapter 3, you have the doctrine of the fall of man. Genesis 6, the doctrine of man's depravity. Genesis 22 is the doctrine of substitutionary atonement seen in its fullest in Jesus Christ. Why do we teach the Bible? So that we not only know about God, you can know there's a God by going outside and seeing it's a beautiful day and knowing there's a creator. That's general revelation. We teach the Bible because we need specific revelation that points me to Jesus Christ and how I can be saved. Teaching. The Bible is profitable for teaching. There's a second word there in verse 16. It is the word reproof. Reproof. Your Bible might have the word rebuke. It's a strong word, a little stronger than teaching, to, to rebuke someone or have reproof. This, you know what this is here? <clears throat> this is the Bible exposing sin. This is the Bible, in a broad sense, exposing false teaching. How, how do we know that we're sinners? This is where it gets difficult for people sometimes to, to see what does the Bible actually, actually say about us. Scripture, what does it do? It shows sinners our failures. Scripture shows saints their hope. Why do we go to the Bible and have our sins exposed? It's not just to see how bad we are. The Bible exposes sin with the purpose of bringing about change. Your sins are exposed by the Bible so that you might see them and confess those sins, turn away from those sins, and by faith turn to Christ in obedience to God. I mean, if you're a Christian for any amount of time, I'll speak in the first person. We have all experienced times of sharp, and, and deep conviction when we've come to the Bible and we realize 
our need for God's grace. And that conviction is there so that we might turn and throw ourselves on the grace of God found in Jesus Christ. The Bible has teaching and, and reproof. Uh, keep looking at verse 16. There's another word. The third word is correction. Uh, the word correction is a more positive word. It's, it's not like um, how we use the word correction. If somebody's correcting you all the time, riding you all the time, that can have a nagging kind of uh, negative feel. That's not what this word is. This word is a positive word. It's used only here in the New Testament. It's the idea of restoring something to its original and proper condition. In regular Greek, this word means uh, to take something that maybe fell down in a storm, to go out there in the yard, pick it up, and stand it up right. This has the idea of helping a person to get back on her feet. That's what the Bible is there for. Correction. It is a, it's a redemptive word. It's a restorative word. It, it's what the psalmist said in Psalm chapter 19, verses 7, 8, and 9, when he talked about the Bible. The psalmist said of the Bible that the law is perfect, restoring or reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. It makes wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right. They rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure. It enlightens the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean. It endures forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Righteous. That's that fourth thing. Verse 16, see the fourth word for correction. And then the fourth thing, training in righteousness. Why do we need training in righteousness? Verse 17 tells us why. That the man or the woman of God might be complete, equipped for every good work. That little phrase, complete and equipped. It's the idea of you know that you want to run that 10K. And the 10K is off. It's six months from now and you sign up for that 10K and you start training. And the first day you train, you're, you can't run but half a mile, and you're lucky to have done that. And, but you keep at it, and you keep at it, and you finally start getting in the right shape so that when the day of the race comes, you are ready to run that race. This is the idea. That here's what the Bible does. It trains us so that when you get up in the morning, you are ready to face whatever is out there. That's what, that's what God's Word does. It teaches, us about, it teaches us about our holy and righteous God. A God that although He hates sin and judges sin, He loves us. And He's shown grace and mercy through His Son, Jesus Christ. You see, He sent Him to fulfill all of his own requirements. Jesus fulfilled all the requirements on behalf of sinners, of us. And then, after fulfilling all the requirements, Jesus took the punishment for sin. Remember what the Bible says? The wages of sin is death. So Jesus died on the cross in the place of sinners. That means that all of the anger and judgment of God towards sinners has been placed on Jesus, and now God is satisfied with you if you believe in Jesus. If you'll turn from your sin and by faith believe in Jesus. That's what I'm asking you to do. Not according to my opinion, but according to what the Bible says. Turn this day from your sin and turn and believe in Jesus. Will you join me as we pray together? Thank you. With your heads bowed this morning, for some of you here that are already believers, you just feel convicted. That is a good and right thing. Possibly you have a besetting sin that you've not been able to shake and you just have been convicted by that today. 
When we have an invitation, that's not just for people wanting to join the church. That's for any of you that are church members, believers. You want to just come and pray here at the altar for a little while. That's fine. You come and do that. This is the Lord's day. It is a good day to turn from your sin and repent of it. There are others of you here that you believe in God. You've got that part covered, but you've not yielded. You've not submitted yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But this morning, by the power of the Holy Spirit, according to God's Word, you believe that. And you need to talk further about what it means to give your life to Jesus. Here at Hickory Grove, we have something called an invitation. That's just simply the church inviting you to come and talk to a pastor or one of our trained leaders about what it means to give your life to Christ. If, if God has spoken to your heart this morning, we'll invite you to come forward. Father, thank you for your word that, that gives us great joy as it points us to Christ. And I pray by your spirit you will call people to yourself today. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Would you stand please as we sing together?